I, uh, I appreciate being here. Um, I will endeavor to do my best and whatever I'm lacking in slides and content, I'll make up for with jokes. How about that? Sound good? So I, uh, uh, anyway, happy Monday morning, right? So I'm not a very formal person. If you have a pressing question, go ahead and jump in. I don't mind. Uh, if it's not that pressing, we could wait and do the discussion part, but I don't mind interruptions. So, uh, and yeah, um, I tried to slap these together as, as well as I can. I'm gonna be missing parts. Some parts won't be missing. Some parts, maybe I focus too much. We'll work it out, right? So anyway, uh, brief introduction real quick as to who I am and what have I done and what do I do and some caveats as well. So I'm I'm Ryan, right? I'm actually like a, a super country boy from Vermont originally, right? I lived out in the middle of nowhere when I grew up. And uh, since then, I have now lived in five different countries on three continents. Uh, I'm a husband and a father to two little kids. I did my undergrad at Mary Washington in Fredericksburg, Virginia, which probably most of you have never heard of. And I did my PhD at University of Virginia and Jefferson Lab a while ago. Uh, so uh, what have I done, right? So, so as far as my career goes, right, I am an accelerator physicist. Uh, my first postdoc was actually in South Korea and I helped them design a low energy beam transport line for a rare isotope machine. Uh, and that is still being commissioned now. So I helped with some of the early designs and then they've iterated on it and they're actually commissioning now. After that, I my second postdoc position was at uh, University of Oxford where I did work on the beam delivery system for the compact linear collider and the international linear collider. I also did some feedback system tests at KEK in Japan while I was there and I taught accelerator physics and also public speaking. Just, just don't tell anyone after today. So um, uh, after that, I went to CERN for a little over a year and I was a project associate. I did more of the beam delivery system simulation work. And I also did work on a post collision line because when beams hit each other, they don't just stop, right? They go past each other. So you need to have a dump line. So I did some simulation work on that as well. Then I was hired at SCKCEN, the Studi Centrum for Kern Energy in Mole, Belgium. And I was their beam optics expert for a, uh, well, as an, Accelerator driven system. I'll get a little bit into that later. Uh, and then they hired me back here uh, because they missed me, right? And so I am actually working in the same group, the Center for Advanced Study Accelerators, where I did my PhD. Mostly I'm working on the upgrade. Um, I also help support operations doing optics on call, stuff like that, uh, and little bits of stuff like this. So anyway, that's who I am. That's what I've done. Uh, as I said, uh, so I'm mostly do beam dynamics, right? That's my forte, right? Optics and beam dynamics of, of particle beams. I've also done a little bit of superconducting radio frequency work. Like I said, operations, education, and outreach. Uh, I consider myself a bit of a generalist because all of my positions were very different. And so I have a lot of experience on different things, but never enough time to really dig super deep. So in some ways, I'm a bit more of a generalist than I am a specific category, uh, which in some ways is good. And in some ways means I won't be able to answer some of your questions, but I'll be honest about them as well. Uh, so uh, caveats, right? I've been doing accelerators for over 19 years now, and uh, it's really broad field. And it involves a little bit of engineering, a lot of math, a lot of science, a lot of everything, right? So as I said, I'm a generalist. I don't know it all, right? And I'll be honest when I don't know it. Uh, and I'm gonna try to keep this talk mostly non-technical. There'll be a couple equations scattered in here and there, but I'll try to keep it easy, right? So we can have a nice discussion on it. And whatever answers I can't give you, uh, we can work out together later, right? If you have a real question that I can't answer, we can work it out. You get hold of me, we'll go through email or whatever, and we'll work out the answer, right? If I can't answer it, I'll find someone who can, so. All right, so uh, those are the caveats. Uh, so now I'm gonna go into a bit of the historical aspects of accelerators. Um, so uh, because I have some colleagues that have worked on this a lot, I'm giving, I, I copped a lot of their slides with permission. I wrote, I'm like, hey, could I steal some of your slides? Can I you know, borrow some of this and mix it together? And so, uh, I borrowed some from Susie Sheehy. She's an assistant or associate professor at University of Melbourne. We used to work together at Oxford. She has a book that just came out and I highly recommend it. It's also an audio book. I just listened to it. Outstanding. Uh, it's kind of a history of science book. I normally don't do nonfiction, but mwah, beautiful. Uh, and then Todd, 
wrote a uh, entry-level accelerator physics textbook, which if you're into accelerators, I also highly, highly recommend. Uh, and also he's my, my boss's boss. He's the head of the CASA group. So um, anyway, his book is there. Uh, so I copped some of their slides for this. And so let's go into picture yourself, 1920s. Not most houses had electricity yet in the beginning of it, right? I think in the UK, it was like 35% of households in the 20s had it in the beginning. By the end, it was around 70%, right? So not a lot of electricity in the home yet. But there's this guy, Rolf Vidoro. I'm probably slaughtering that name, but his thesis was actually uh, from 1924. He did a single drift tube with two gaps, 25 kilovolt, one megahertz AC voltage, got a 50 kilovolt kinetic energy beam. And that was kind of the first accelerator, right? So 1924. Uh, and then, you know, in the 20s, they started doing a lot of electrostatics, right? Let's uh, let's do the Tesla coil, everybody, right? We've all played with those at some point. Uh, tried harnessing the lightning, right? And they were able to get up to about 15 megavolts for this. So, you know, going through, we're working, we're working. And then uh, enter the Van der Graaff. I'm sure at some point you've all also played with a Van der Graaff generator, right? Uh, as a quick side note, you can also use one of these to power an accelerator in a bowl. And if you ever want more information on that, let me know. But basically, you take a solid bowl and you coat the inside of it with conductive material and you get a ping pong ball coated in another conductive kind of paint and you connect it to a Van der Graaff generator and give it a little tap and it'll actually accelerate around the bowl. And it's kind of a cool thing for like students to do uh, for science fairs and stuff. If you look it up, particle accelerator in a bowl, it's all over the web. It's brilliant. So you can use, you know, and a, a Van der Graaff for that. And so, uh, how, you know, we all know how they work, but a quick review, right? You get your down to the bottom. I like to use fingers instead. You know, you have your electrode. It deposits the charges. They're swept off. I, I'm not that tall, so I'll point here, right? And it transports it. And this is a type of accelerator, right? It's just not so that interesting one for these days, but back then it was really interesting. And uh, it got up to about 20 megavolts in SF6. So... Moving on next, with more, we have the first accelerator in Cambridge. You can see here, uh, well, I'm not have to point, but you can see where the rectifier, transformer, acceleration tube, and the birch pump are. Uh, this was 1930, and they actually got up to 200 kilovolts. So we're still in the KV range, but hey, that's something, right? We're moving, we're moving. Uh, and then comes the Cockroft Walton accelerator in 1932. And this was also at Cambridge. Uh, and you can see there, um, well, you can see the size of it, right? Because he's sitting in a box there to shield himself from, from the fears that he has about what might happen. And uh, and yeah, so so we're up to the Calcroft Walton now. Uh, and then moving on, there's how that works, right? So you can get your protons to above an MeV. That's big progress in the 30s, right? You have a continuous high voltage applied through intermediate electrodes, as you can see in the diagram. Um, and in a way, this could also be considered an early ion source because you have hydrogen gas ionized with high voltage current and there you go, right? So selling it a little bit. Next up comes the cyclotron. Now we're talking, right? Now we're talking about a real accelerator. And so, uh, we can thank Ernst Lawrence for this. Uh, he was actually inspired by Vitero's paper, even though he didn't speak German, he saw some of the equations in it. He's like, oh, I can, I can extrapolate from here, right? And so it's kind of funny. He was just bored one day, I think in a library and he was reading through and he's like, oh, look, I uh, I don't speak any of the German, but I can understand the math, right? Universal language, right? So he started going through and doing the math and he realized that um, if you have constant mass and a constant charge, then R cancels R, right? And uh, the orbit radius will be proportional to the speed. Uh, it turns out he didn't understand relativistic mass yet, but you know, baby steps, baby steps. Uh, but in a, in a way, you know, can we repeatedly spiral and accelerate particles through the same potential gap is the idea of a cyclotron. Uh, so you can see there, you know, B field and, you know, everyone right hand rule, right? You go through and you keep accelerating through the gap and every time it goes, it gets more energy and it spirals out. And so that's, that's where the cyclotron comes in. Uh, some of the small ones there, right? So we have 1934 patent on this. There's a bigger one with Ernst Lawrence and Livingston down there at the bottom. Uh, let's look at this one real quick though. 13 centimeters is indicated at the top of that picture, right? You have a large static magnetic field, about a Tesla. 
no vertical focusing, right? That hasn't come into play yet. Uh, you have high voltage radio frequency electric fields for accelerating. Um, again, there's some terms in there, no phase focusing, no precise frequency control. They hadn't considered any of this yet, right? They just want to move the particles. Um, so you have a P or an H source and you inject it, uh, extract, you have a vacuum. The 13 centimeter one there that you see in the picture could actually get up to 80 kilo electron volts. And then they made them bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And they kept going. Uh, and so that was up through about 1940. And then we go from the 40s to about the 60s, where everything just kind of exploded, right? It really took off. And so we've got the Betatron, right? In a way, you can consider the Betatron like a transformer, and the beam is a secondary coil. Um, it is usually used for relativistic electrons. So cyclotron is generally protons, right? You can do the electrons in it, but they get relativistic really quick. So, uh, But this is usually used for elect relativistic electrons. In 1940, they were able to get up to 300 MeV, which is pretty respectable, right? You could do stuff with 300 MeV. And uh, basically, you change the magnetic field, um, and you watch them go through a circular orbit of a fixed radius as they're accelerated. Uh, a little more on that. Basically, just apply Faraday's law with time-varying current in the coils, and the beam sees the time-varying electric field, accelerates half the time, right? So it gets a little kick half of the time. Um, and yeah, uh, as Todd pointed out, don't try some of these things at home. Maybe don't get that close to an accelerator while it's on. It's uh, frowned upon. But um, a little bit more. So so when you're extracting, and I'll show more of this in a second, I think. Uh, oops, did not mean to hit that yet. But, but this is the idea of the Betatron from 1940, right? So you extract up at the top there. Uh, you accelerate on the slopes, and you inject where it's indicated there. Uh, this is, of course, field over time is, is what that is plotting. Um, so they were able to get up to 300, over 300 MeV. Um, they were actually used for early materials and medical research. As you can see there, uh, Todd put together a nice humorous little bit. Uh, it'll only hurt a bit. Uh, but Betatrons also have challenges, right? Linear aperture scaling, large stored energy and impedance, synchrotron radiation losses, um, weren't super aware of that early on. Uh, but yeah, um, synchrotron radiation is real and you have to be careful of it. Uh, quarter duty cycle ramping magnetic field quality. So let's talk a little bit about this phase stability that I indicated, all right. So I will use the pointer for a bit. Let's say you come in at M1, right? Let's say your particle is there. You're receiving a higher voltage, right? Which means you're gonna get kicked a little harder, right? And when you're kicked a little harder, you're gonna take the long way around. Right, because it gives you an extra kick. And so you're when you're wrapping around, you're going to take a wider path, which means the next time you come around, you're going to be arriving late. Right. Alternatively, if you arrive at N here, you're receiving a smaller kick, a smaller voltage, right? And so your path around the loop will be a little smaller, right? The big one and the small one. Just pretend I don't have T-Rex arms, right? The big one and small one, right? And so then you'll arrive a little early. And so you'll kind of be in this, as long as you're between these points, you'll keep kind of going between them, right? And P1 is nice and synchronous, right? If you arrive on time, you arrive on time next time, just like the trains in Japan, right? Um, bad joke if you've never been to Japan, but I, yeah, I was impressed. Anyway, um, so so anyway, that's the, the rough idea on phase stability, right? And how these rings work. Uh, if you wanted an equation, I know someone in here wants the equation, so I'm going to put them in there, right? Uh, but this also demonstrates that you have to have focusing, right? Because if you don't, then the beam's just going to spread apart. And so you have to have transverse focusing to actually keep the beam in. And that's what this is demonstrating here. That's all. I'm not going to go super detailed on it. Uh, then 1947 comes around and I realize, oh, the synchrotron stuff is actually useful. Look. Uh, and it turns out it actually gives off light and they found it kind of by accident, but they found it and they're like, oh, what is this? And then boom, uh, synchrotron light. Uh, quick aside, major, major, the majority of radio sources in the universe emit synchrotron process, via synchrotron processes. Um, so I just pointing that out as well. So that's 1947. And here we're going again. You can see this picture from 1950. We got the Brookhaven National Lab Cosmotron, which got up to about three GeV. Now we're really cooking with fire, right? The GeV range. 
Now, you also notice this is getting pretty big, right? That's not a small machine anymore, right? And they only get bigger from there. Then you got the Lawrence Berkeley Lab Bevatron. Beva meaning giga, right? They, you know, the old days, they weren't sure how to name things. But you can see, right, this was the last and largest, what they called weak focusing. Get into that in a second as well. But yeah, 1954, they had a four foot square beam aperture. That's, I mean, I'm five, six, right? So that's about here, right? That's a pretty big aperture for a beam pipe. And, uh, but they did discover the antiproton in 55. And uh, actually this helped with a Nobel prize in 59. So again, this is getting really big and they're getting way too big. The magnet in the Bevatron was 10,000 tons. Uh, and the apertures just get bigger as you scale, right? So this is starting to become a real problem. Now, some of you might be thinking, but CERN is 27 kilometers. Yeah, 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 we'll get there. The, the beam, you know, it's, it's, it's much improved. It's big, but for a different reason, okay? So uh, also it gets a little hard to deal with the fixed targets on this and, and they keep growing with your desired center of mass energy. So uh, then comes strong focusing in 1952 which also led to colliders. Strong focusing, what is strong focusing? Well, um, if you can put magnets in such a way that they are focusing, so a quadrupole, for example, if you put a quadrupole, I'll use my hands, right? Can everyone see these? All right, so, so with a quadrupole, right? Uh, they focus in one plane while also defocusing in the other. So if you have a horizontally focusing quadrupole magnet, it'll focus everything tightly in the horizontal plane, but then in a vertical plane, going up. So then you have to alternate that with another quadrupole to then bring down your vertical plane, but then it spits out that way. So you have to keep alternating these, right? And that's kind of how they maintain the beam as it goes through. In one plane, it'll kind of be wobbling like this, and the other plane will be going like this. Now there are tricks, right, to where you can put more of these quadrupoles together and get them to be, you know, going together in both planes, but that's beyond the scope of this element in time, right? Uh, but this is a game changer, right? Because now they're actually controlling the beam in both planes and able to maintain it in a much smaller aperture. We don't have to have the four foot aperture anymore. Uh, and that, this is where it really took off, right? So again, Livingston, uh, so, so there's a paper by Courant, Snyder, Livingston, and uh, one version also has Christophilios who actually, actually came up with the idea first, but didn't get credit until he was later hired by the group. But, you know, at least they hire them, right? So, uh, but this this was a game changer and this strong focusing. You can actually look up the old paper from 52, 53. Uh, it's a worthwhile read. You learn a lot. Um, but then look, we start getting these machines in the 50s that are much more compact and still able to manage larger energy. So we have 1.3 GeV uh, with an injector that's actually a Van de Graaff, right? So you actually bring bring it up that way and then get the, get the particles in. And then 1961, you've got your first electron collider where they're actually hitting the beams into each other. So that was the period of rapid progress from the forties to the sixties. Let's look a little bit more at the modern area, era, 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 sorry. Uh, so I wanted to start real quick with what we call the Livingston plots, right? Uh, basically, accelerator energy grows exponentially, right? But it seems to be that it stagnates for a while, and then some new tech comes and it makes a jump, right? And it's still pretty much holding true, right? We keep going up in energy and up in energy, but it always takes something to spark it, right? You can see uh, like the electrostatic generators, for example, here, right? And then, you know, there's these major jumps. Uh, and so LEP for colliders. Uh, anyway, you can all read it. I won't go through every single point, but this is where we start seeing these jumps, right? And so we have ISR as the first Hadron Collider, uh, which had a center of mass energy of 62 GeV, right? Uh, also discovery of stochastic cooling, which is, uh, I'm not gonna get into the details on that. That is a worthwhile thing to Google at some point, uh, well beyond the scope of my understanding. So <laughs> it is uh, very complicated. And then of course we start getting the Tevatron at Fermilab and superconducting magnets, right? Superconducting magnets also really changed the way things work because now we can get to massive magnetic fields with not so much wall plug power, right? Now cooling is another factor, but you know, we won't, we won't 
break too many eggs with that one. Uh, but you know, this this is the Tevatron. And then I would be remiss in my duties as a JLab staff member if I did not talk about the superconducting radio frequency technology, which <clears throat> during the 70s and 80s, really like the, the really groundbreaking and pioneering efforts came at Cornell University. And then JLab hired a bunch of Cornell people. And uh, there's actually a placard at Cornell kind of commemorating the uh, the movement of their staff to Jefferson Lab, one of which just recently gave his um, his farewell talk because he's retiring. Uh, but Charlie Reese, if anyone knows him, he's retiring. He was at Cornell doing the pioneering efforts and then came here and brought all the great ideas here. And then JLab became the first large accelerator in the world to actually use uh, superconducting radio frequency technology to accelerate beams in a large scale manner. Now, I'll get into a little, little bit of this when I talk about rings versus Linux, but superconducting cavities have existed, right, in rings and stuff, but Linux are all accelerating structures. And so this JLab was the first in the world to actually do this. Um, and so there you can see a photo of the cavities, right? So that's a, uh, hold on, I didn't count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's a nine cell cavity there. So nine cells of niobium in a cavity. And then you stick those into a cryo module. You guys took a tour on Friday, right? Okay, excellent. So I can talk to points because I took, I took a bunch of my old photos and stuck them throughout this talk. And now it'd be like, oh, do you remember seeing this, right? Okay, so we'll work that out. All right, so that was the historical background. Now let's go into some applications, uh, right? Because accelerators, we all know they're for nuclear and particle physics, blah, 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 right? But let's ignore nuclear and particle physics for a minute. I know, I know, sacrilegious, but let's ignore it for a little bit and look at some of the other things. Not all the other things, just some of the other things that they're actually used for. Let's go into medicine first, right? because uh, a beam of particles is very useful. You can look here, medical Linux and ion implantation, electron beam material processing, electron beam welding or, uh, is actually another one, but it's not on this list. Um, non you know, so I'm not gonna read this to you, um, but there's a lot of uses for these things. And uh, this is all the accelerators installed worldwide, right? And you can see a significant number of them are from medicine. I believe Hampton University has a proton accelerator specifically for cancer treatment. Um, so there you go. You're all with the Hampton University graduates, right? So uh, just showing, right? Let's start with cancer treatment. And so this is a bit of a depressing slide. I know we'll go, we'll go through it. But yes, while cancer deaths are going up because we're living longer, if you actually normalize for or age standardized, right? It's actually going down. We're getting better at treating cancer. It's still horrible. It's, you know, we're working on it, but we're getting better at treating it. And a lot of this is actually through radiotherapy. And accelerators are used for radiotherapy, right? And this is an example. Uh, Varian Medical Systems makes some of these commercially. Um, also, IBA makes some. There's other companies that make them as well. But you have an S band Linac. You have, a, I'm not going to tell you what achromatic means right now, but it basically means. I will real quick. Okay, so you have dispersion, right? So so when beam comes through a, a dipole magnet, it, you know, if there's multiple energies, it spreads out just like light through a prism, like the like the Pink Floyd album cover, right? And so that is essentially what you can consider dispersion, right? Achromatic means you put it back together, right? And so they have a bend that even though it bends it and separates all the different energies out, they then stick them back together by the end of it. So it's achromatic is what they call it. Um, and then you strike a foil, create your x-rays, you have a collimation system, and then you treat the patient with an accelerator, right? So there's x-ray radio, there's also proton Linux and uh, carbon Linux, and then all these ways to treat. Uh, so you can see, for example, right, using a proton beam, um, you find, we all know Bragg Peak. I think we all took up, you're all graduate students, right? So I'm thinking Bragg Peak is a known thing. Uh, but the cool thing is with these particles, is that you can say, all oh, right, there's a tumor kind of deep inside. Uh, how do we get that without irradiating the whole body, right? Like we do commonly. And so what they do is they can actually take a proton beam or a carbon ion and accelerate it to a specific energy so that given that depth of tumor in the person, that's where it stops and starts giving off its medical properties, right? Like that's where it decays and actually strikes the tumor, you have minimal invasiveness coming in, 
no kind of exit wound, so to speak. And uh, it's, it's, you can treat tumors in eyes, in the brain. Um, the, one of the hardest parts, of course, is that it's a moving target, right? The person is, is you know, uh, I like to call biology squishy science, right? Like people are moving, right? And so it, it's a moving target that's not, not perfectly periodic or anything like that. So they have to work on targeting systems and all this stuff, but it's rapidly growing field. And that is one of these uh, excellent uses of accelerators. Um, I do want to give a quick aside. While this is accessible to a lot of us in the rich countries, low income and medium income countries don't have as much income or as, as much access to these. So there are, for example, the Stella collaboration. So Susie Sheehy, who I stole this slide from, you can see it on the corner. She's part of the Stella collaboration. And uh, I would be remiss in my duties of stealing her slides without actually telling her or telling about this, this collaboration, which is actually really putting efforts forward into bringing medical accelerators and medical treatment technology into, for example, sub-Saharan Africa and other areas that don't have the access. One of the problems, even if they have the accelerator, for example, um, they don't have spare parts. And so if something breaks in it, they have to wait months to, to get a spare part to come, right? And then they have to know who can then fix it. So they're working on ways to train local technicians and get better spare systems and whatnot to then make it more accessible for people in low income and medium income countries to have access to this life-saving technology. Sorry, I'll step off my soapbox now. But uh, another one is radioisotope production, right? So this is uh, a real strong uh, case for keeping a lot of accelerators around. Uh, Accelerators, mostly compact cyclotrons and linux, are used for this. Uh, usually you need 7 to 11 MeV protons for short-lived isotopes, 70 to 100 MeV for higher or longer-lived isotopes. Um, you can see on the right, you can see the IBA. Uh, so IBA is a Belgian company that makes cyclotrons uh, commercially available, and uh, they also make some medical systems as well. Um, interesting side note on radioisotope production. Some of these are truly, truly short-lived. And so at... Uh, in Vancouver at Triumph, they produce radioisotopes. And then they actually, you know, at the bank, you do the drive through and they have the, the pneumatic tube where you stick your, your paper check. Does anyone use paper checks anymore? You stick your cash, whatever you're going to, you know, you stick it in and sucks it up, right? They have one of those. They call the rabbit. In, in, it actually takes the radioisotopes and zaps it in a tube under the street up to the hospital, right? So it takes, I think, two or three minutes, I could be rem misremembering the time, as opposed to like, if you were to drive it there, it would take like 20 or 30 minutes, right? So they actually just have a pneumatic system to like produce a radioisotope, stick it in a tube and suck it over and it goes into the, the hospital. And so they can, yeah, it's it's pretty clever. So you know, anyway, that's at Triumph, uh, T-R-I-U-M-F in Vancouver. Uh, also worth Googling at some point, it's kind of cool. Um, so what else do we use accelerators for? Let's go into industry. Ion plan implantation, right? You are all aware. I mean, we're using a computer to present this right now, right? Microchips, we have to implant ions under them. Ion implantation is a big industrial usage. Electron beam processing. So there we go. We, 33% um, wire cable tuning. You know, they have all these different uses for electron beam processing. We have equipment sterilization, which uses also accelerators. Uh, I'm not going to read through all the points. I have them here. The, the PDF version of this is online, so you can actually read every single point, but I don't want to bore you by reading slides. You can read yourself. Food irradiation, right? So this is how we all become superheroes. I mean, this is how we all keep our food so that we can eat it in the long run, right? And uh, gemstone irradiation, this one throws people for a loop, but a lot of those blue gemstones you buy are not actually blue in nature. They irradiate them and turn them blue for you. So there you go, if you didn't know that. Uh, and then I'm just going to skip to the end and do a bunch of non-destructive testing, uh, hardening of surfaces and artificial joints, scratch-resistant furniture, hardening of tarmac, detecting wine forgeries. You can look that one up. That one's kind of fun. Uh, I'm trying to move along a little, but uh, let's look also environmental, right? Wastewater treatment. Now, this one is interesting. So in South Korea and a few other countries, they're actually treating their wastewater with, uh, sorry, with uh, accelerators, right? So they're irradiating the water 
to get rid of, for example, the forever chemicals that we've all been hearing about, right? And all scared of now, right? Because, well, I mean, they're a little scary. They're in all of us now, but they're actually doing this. And I also would be remiss if I didn't point out that this has been tested at JLab as well. We have a small little accelerator called the UITF um, upgraded injector test facility, which is currently not in, uh, I'll get into that later, but we had to take it apart to, to cannibalize some of the parts for the main accelerator here. But uh, it is still here, it still exists, except for it's missing that SRF cryo module in the middle right here. So this is our UITF, the beam goes that away. And uh, they did tests on this and showed really powerfully how well this, this was a sub 10 MeV, right? 10 MeV is kind of the limit where you start producing neutrons in water. So you keep it below 10 MeV, you start irradiating the stuff in the water and it starts breaking it apart. And so a lot of the chemicals they tested were pretty much gone at pretty low energy beam. And so that was impressive. Uh, also, right, you can use ion beam analysis methods to look for aerosols and pollutants. You can, now this, this is one of my favorites, right? Accelerator driven systems. Uh, we all know that there's a bit of an energy crisis, right? Now, accelerator driven system, what is that? You take a nuclear reactor with subcritical uh, fuel, let's say, and when you then take a proton LINAC and strike a target and make neutrons, you can then basically run this reactor, uh, cause it to go kind of critical, except for when, as soon as you turn off the accelerator, the reactor is no longer on. It cannot melt down because it is subcritical in its natural state. The only way you can actually create energy from this is to then turn back on the accelerator, right? Now, there are a lot of problems with this. It's really difficult, first off, because you need uptime of the accelerator beyond what is technically feasible right now, right? That was part of my old job at my last place in Belgium was creating such a reliable accelerator that it's up for well over 92% of the time, um, which if there's any experimentalist in the room will be laughing right now because, um, well, with all the beam trips that happen here, uh, we all we all know that that's not an easy feat, uh, but that's what they're working on. The other part of these ADS systems is treating waste. So you can actually um, put the waste into containers in the reactor and then kind of zap it with the beam and it breaks it down. It helps along the process of decay so that you no longer have 300,000 year half-life, but like 300 or 3,000 year half-life, which is a significant change, right? Now, this is all still in the works. So I used to work for the Mira project over there. They are in Mole, Belgium, and you can see a bit of what they are planning. They have two injectors because injectors always go down. So you want to have one on hot standby so that within you know a fraction of a second, when one's down, the other one comes up. Uh, and then they'll took uh, in phase two, when they actually have the reactor, they want to have a 600 MeV proton beam, very high power of a proton beam going in, striking the target, making the neutrons and running the reactor. Uh, now, China is a bit ahead of the game. They have actually started, like in, in Mira, they have an injector built and they've got a couple prototypes of cavities and they have some really good ideas, um, but that's as far as they are right now, right? Um, in China, they've actually started like building a lot and they have significant sections of this constructed, uh, different target technologies slightly um, because uh, I mean, it's details that aren't so so keen. This is a little hard to see. You can see where Mira is going to be. Uh, cafe is over there. This is the Cafe Linac. Um, you can, the proceedings are not out yet, um, but once they're out, if you look up the IP, IPAC 23 proceedings, you can actually look through the paper on all of this stuff. Um, it should come out in the next few months. Uh, the, it would the, the conference just happened in May. So it's, I'm giving you the newest news, right? Uh, anyway. So that was one of my favorites. Another quick aside, um, we're talking about environmental. So here's another soapbox I'm gonna step on real quick. Large scale accelerators are extremely power hungry and uh, you can't really consider them very green by their very nature, right? Uh, however, in the last few years, there's been real efforts to change that and to address some of these concerns. Um, so we wanna reduce carbon footprints. We wanna make sure that if we build new accelerators, how can we do so in a way that is least damaging to the environment uh, for example, at IPAC 23 that I just mentioned, there was a whole bunch of talks on how do we make this greener, right? 
uh, there's a long way to go, right? Uh, especially because some projects, uh, I'm going to throw one under the bus. So um, at CERN, right, they're looking at building this 100 kilometer ring, uh, the FCC. And, and everyone's like, yeah, it's going to bring the energy up and everything. And then you have to realize that one of the biggest uh, problems environmentally with any of these new constructions is concrete. So if you have a 100 kilometer tunnel, right, that's a lot of concrete, but it's not just a 100 kilometer tunnel, then you need access tunnels and uh, peripheries. And so that all ends up to about another 100 kilometers, right? So you've got 200 kilometer of concrete tunnel. That's a lot of concrete, right? Um, and right now, one of the problems is that different projects, because unfortunately, you know, these things cost money. So everyone's trying to sell and pitch their project. And while the science case might be great and it's wonderful, um, they're trying to kind of like renormalize how things are done, right? So they're like, oh, look, our carbon footprint will be X. And then they're like, ah, but if you normalize for luminosity, right? So carbon footprint per luminosity, then this project is better. And it's like, yeah, I get you, right? But let's, let's, let's just try to actually address the problem. So there's a long way to go, but okay. I'm stepping back down off my soapbox again. So just putting that out there. And uh, another one of my favorite subjects here. Uh, they can be used for cultural heritage and art studies. So if you go about 15 meters below, have anyone been to the Louvre before? Yeah, so you know the big pyramid, right? Go 15 meters down, they have an accelerator, Luagre. And it's 2MeV, electrostatic pelotron accelerator. And it is only dedicated to the study of cultural heritage, like art. It uses ion beam analysis, so Pixie, Piggy, RBS. Not going to get into all those, but look them up because, uh, again, limited time, limited resources. Um, but you can see some of the things they have done, right? So they have found paintings under paintings because canvas also costs money. And back when these artists were working on it, like, ah, I don't really like this painting so much. I'll paint over it. Well, we can see that now, right? We can see their mistakes. I don't know if I would like that personally, right? If I if I put out my masterpiece and it turns out I had to reuse a canvas, like, oh, look at that really piece of crap one under there, right? Like, you know, I, I don't know how I'd feel about that, but hey, it's an interesting study nonetheless. Um, another cool one though, that one of my colleagues from Liverpool is working on, her name's Tessa Charles. Um, I stole some of this from her. I actually had to deliver this talk two years ago for her because she couldn't. Um, but imagine if we could take petroglyphs and whatnot to an accelerator uh, and then study what's actually on these petroglyphs, right? So there are some ways to do this, right? They have, they have some technology, little handheld things you can go, but it doesn't really give you the full picture haha, of what's going on. Um, it turns out that in Italy, they do have a movable accelerator for cultural heritage in situ non-destructive analysis. Now it's at INFN. It is functional. They say movable. It's not quite movable. Uh, it could be if you can also get all the peripherals and whatnot attached and bring it everywhere. But there's a lot of peripherals in Accelerate. You were all down in the tunnel. You see there's a lot of wires and cables and there's a whole thing upstairs. So, I mean, this is small, right? But it's, uh, it's not quite portable. And so actually uh, my colleague from Liverpool is looking into how we can basically put one of these in container right, and bring it to sites to then scan things like petroglyphs or rock art around the world. Uh, so there's a lot of other applications for these accelerators. And I just wanted to kind of put that out there, right? Just a handful of them. So what are they for? Now I'm looking at the time. I can either take a pause now or I could do types of accelerators and take a pause. Uh, and then I'll continue after the discussion break. It's up to you guys. Do you want me to keep going now and talk or, or, or talk now and then keep going? All right. If you, if you want to talk now, hand up. And if you want me to keep going, hand up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Is that okay with it? So it keep going for a bit. All right. So I will, I'll do types of accelerators and then we'll take the break and discuss. And then the last two sections are a little short, but that's okay, because then we can have a long talk after, right? So let's do types of accelerators, just to get into some of the basics, right? Really some of the basics. So again, lots of other types, right? I'm going to do 
a little bit of A and B, but then A and B break out into entire alphabets themselves. So let's do rings first. Uh, I've never worked with rings. I'm a Linac guy, so I'm incredibly biased, but rings are how they teach everything. So I'll start with rings, right? So the first thing you have to realize about a ring, it's mostly magnets with a little bit of acceleration, right? So the LHC at CERN, like I said, 27 kilometer ring. It only has 16 superconducting radio frequency cavities split into four cryomodules. That's a cryomodule. Uh, I got to see that at SM18 at CERN. That's it. So they've only got four of those, two for each direction, right? That's it. The rest of it is pretty much all magnets because they have, well, you see the spare dipoles over there, right? Those are each 15 meters long and they've got 1,232 of them plus about 400 quadrupoles ranging from five to seven meters. Then a bunch of interaction region magnets and correctors. And, and then of course you also have to get all the diagnostics in and everything else. So it's really a lot of magnets, right? And then I don't know how many of you seen on the internet, they have like, you know, the, the cars, like the little toy cars you get with the track, right? And some of those tracks have like a little boost, right? And so some clever people have made a ring out of those and had the little boost on the side and you can kind of see the car whipping around. That's what a ring is, right? It really is a little accelerator they made out of their little plastic track and toy car. Uh, that's the idea. You get a boost every time you pass one of these accelerating cavities and then you kind of guide it around and you keep boosting it and boosting it. So that, that is the rough idea of a ring. Different types of rings. We talked about the synchrotron. We have at PSI, uh, 590 MeV uh, isochronous cyclotron, and another one at PSI as well. Yep, both of those are uh, IBA, I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is the Swiss light source. Um, first off, I just wanted to take a, a quick aside as a, a lover of cool architecture, but that's all a wooden roof. Uh, when I took that tour, it was really cool. Apparently it's actually safer for fires to have a wooden roof. I don't understand why, um, but that's what they pitched it to me as. I just think it looks cool. But you can see the actual ring going around here. Um, so anyway, that's the Swiss light source. Uh, then we have the extra low energy anti-proton ring at CERN, Elena, which is used as part of their accelerator decelerator anti-proton, uh, or sorry, antimatter factory. Yep, there is a real antimatter factory at CERN. There's a sign and everything. Um, sounds like science fiction, but it's there and it's real. Uh, you can also see the Lear ring at CERN. Um, both of these are, I, I took these photos when I was there. Um, I love taking photos. So uh, anyway, different rings, right? And then we're going to do a little video of a ring being used for Linac because a lot of time Linacs are used to help rings, but rings can also be used to help Linacs. So, and you're going to see another bit of the same thing later, but here we have a bunch of electrons coming in, but we want them, those bunches closer together. And so as they come in, we get them closer like that, and then we keep recirculating them. This is called an accumulator ring. And they keep coming around and around until we get a nice train of electrons to then stick into the main accelerator. So this is an accumulator, or they call it a combiner ring. It's basically an accumulator ring where you keep adding more and more particles and then extract them as you need. So I wanted to give a quick aside of ring supporting Linux as opposed to the other way, which is more common. Uh, so a couple minor but important points, uh, ring optics. So basically how the beam is behaving are designed specifically to meet a periodic condition so that you can recirculate and get a specific kind of pattern of optics around the machine. Uh, Linux are often used to get particles up to speed in the machine, right? So that's the opposite of what I just showed you. You get a Linux to then get whatever particle you're getting up to the right energy. Then you can start using the, the ring. Um, when it's a non-relativistic particle, the accelerator structures in a LINAC have to vary with uh, V over C, right? And so for a proton LINAC, right, it starts off, all the cavities are kind of close together, and then they get bigger and more spread out as they go. Gets a little hard for that. With electrons, it's not such a big deal because they're relativistic like that. Um, electrons are relativistic in the KEV range, like I was saying. Uh, and so that high energy electrons in rings it's kind of frowned upon, right? You spit off a lot of synchrotron radiation. You start losing as much energy as you're gaining. It, you get to a point of diminishing returns. It's not the most efficient way. Uh, so now let me go to my favorite part because I'm biased. Uh, Linux, right? So get in line, right? 
Uh, contrary to ring-based accelerated Linux, are mostly accelerating components with some magnets mixed in, right? So you were all down in the tunnel. I don't know. I think Silver Streak was still in. I don't know if you all paid attention to all the names of them, but this this one's not too old of a picture. But I wanted to point out, right? So that's the quadrupole, and there's a magnet wrapped around a beam position monitor, and that's a skew quad, right? So there's all these little magnets in there, uh, but the majority of it is taken up by our accelerating structures. And that is the big difference, right? More accelerating structures, less magnets. Uh, now, beam lines are another thing. There's no accelerating structures. They're just magnets too, but they're put in a different way. Um, so let's go into a few types of Linux, right? So I was saying that a lot of time you have to have a Linux before you can get into the ring. That's what Linux 2 is. So right here is the bottle. So I don't know if you know this, but but the, the protons at CERN are actually, they come out of like a little, it looks like a fire extinguisher, a little bottle of hydrogen, and it spits out a little bit of gas. And then they take those and they stick them through Linux. Well, Linux 2 has now been retired and they're Linux 3 now, but that's why I could get this picture actually. But uh, so Linux 2 would then take those and accelerate them into the rest of the system at CERN. It actually goes through a different ring and then another ring and another ring until it gets the LHC. Um, but that's where it all starts. And that over there is a low energy beam transport radio frequency quadrupole. Now quadrupoles, you're like, oh, you just told me that those are for focusing. Well, RFQs are an exception. They both focus and bunch and accelerate the beam. Uh, and so they are used, in this case, it's a proton accelerator. That's actually going to be used for an ADS later, but that is part of the lower energy beam transport at SCK, CEN. Uh, we also have Drift2 Linux. And uh, of course, we would be remiss if we didn't mention the XFEL at Daisy, um, which is an X-ray free electron laser based on all, it's all Linux. And actually, interestingly, there's another project called the International Linear Collider, which if agreed upon uh, would be based in Japan, um, up in Northern Japan near Morioka. And uh, the XFEL is actually using the same cavity technology. It's essentially a small version of what the ILC would be if it ever gets built. So um, anyway, that was a, another quick aside. Now let me show you another fun video. It includes some of the other one, but it's the long one. Now this is the compact linear collider, which is another linear collider option, more likely to not be built now, but we're still gonna go into it. So we have, it, it uses actually two accelerator systems, Linux. They have a drive beam and a main beam. The main beam is used for colliding electrons and positrons. And the drive beam is used to power the main beam. And so here we have, you can see the drive beam accelerate at the top. And then, you know, this, the, the combiner ring, like I was mentioning, and another combiner ring. And so basically, I'll let the video do most of the talking, but, uh, you saw, right, it has a bit there, and then you have the delay loop. We saw this video a second ago, so I'll chat a bit more. They take, <clears throat> the reason they want these so close together is because they want it to be a very high intensity electron beam, right? And so you stick the bunches closer together, kind of maximize the amount of current you got in a train. And then what you do is you send this accelerated beam through, and then you decelerate it, take the energy from that through an RF system to then power the main beam. Right, so this gives you much less wall plug power, so to speak, right? Because you're not creating a high energy beam here, you're creating a high intensity beam. Sending it through, you can see it's coming in. At the same time, we have our electrons and positrons being created down here, right? But you look up at the, up there, it's going around. Uh, coming through, you have your booster Linac, you have your electrons and positrons coming around at the same time as the drive beam. The drive beam then pulls the energy through, accelerates the electrons through. This is, an amazing feat, right? This is really cool design. It likely won't get built, unfortunately, but uh, it was like 25 years of work from around the world of people trying to make this work, right? And they, they really worked hard to make it a very viable solution. It's still expensive, right? But it's a lot less power than it would be to do this. For example, it's also regular conducting instead of superconducting. I shouldn't say that at JLab, but regular conducting copper cavities uh, instead of superconducting to get this going. Um, the ILC, the International Linear Collider, is superconducting like the EXFO. Um, but I had to show this as well because I thought this was a cool thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Ah, so this this is kind of a way of getting power transfer in a way that doesn't take as much power like from the wall plug, right? So you, you make this high intensity beam, but not a lot of high energy. And then by taking that, you put it through, you, you decelerate it, and that kinetic energy is then used through the RF system to then power, further power the main beam, right? So you're you're kind of getting, instead of just powering it directly, right, and requiring that wall plug power, you're you're getting to, through that trickery, through getting, you know, the, uh, the combiner ring and everything, you're actually able to power that main beam that way. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a slightly greener way of doing it. Although again, if you look at the scale, right, each one of these Linux is 22 kilometers. So uh, it's, it's still not small. <laughs> they call this the compact linear collider, but that, that, that is a, a relative term, right? It's compact to what it would be if it was using other technology. Um, anyway. Uh, and, and I, of course, I have to spit out what JLab is. We are a Linac, but we are a recirculating Linac. You can actually think of us as one long Linac that got folded over on itself, right? Uh, and I think that's the easiest way. It saves space. Uh, we have those recirculating arcs, uh, which are vertical. You all walk through. I don't know. Where did, did you go through the entire? Or probably not. There's a lot of construction going on. You saw part of the arc? Okay. Um, well, you can see here more of the arc, right? Or at least part of it. So you have the lowest energy beam gets bent up and then the highest energy beams at the bottom. And uh, it's done through the spreaders and recombiners there, but um, we'll get more into that in a bit. Uh, Linux are not designed to meet that same periodic condition that rings are, right? The optics is, is meant to basically meet a specific condition at the end. And so they're really great for fixed targets. They're really great for, they could be really great for colliders, um, but uh, the luminosity is a little bit harder because, so in a ring, right, if the beam comes around and misses, it gets another shot, right? But with linear colliders, well, that that's all she wrote, right? It, if it misses, it misses, right? There is no bringing it back around uh, and trying again. So luminosity is a bit lower. It's also for that click, for example, um, the beam you're trying to collide is four nanometers by 40 nanometers uh, of size, right? So it's like like trying to take a piece of toilet paper and another piece of toilet paper and throw them at each other and hope they hit, right? It's just like real thin, flat thing you're trying to hit. And so uh, it, it is complicated to get a linear collider to work. It has only happened once at Slack. Um, so uh, another interesting point that a lot of accelerator physicists that don't work on Linux fail to mention, but mathematically, the so-called twist parameters, which are basically how you describe an ellipse in phase space where the beam occupies. Uh, mathematically, it's identical, right? The math is the same for the twist parameters and some of these parameters in Linux and in uh, rings, but they're describing a slightly different thing. Uh, and so that's where the kind of physical difference comes in. In a ring, um, because you have this periodic condition, the beam goes around and around and around and around, and it fills up a space that's defined by the lattice, right? And that's what the that's what the twist parameter is describing in a ring, but in a Linac you don't have that periodic condition, so you're actually just describing the beam itself, and that that's the major difference. Uh, so in in a Linac, uh, you have to just be careful when you're speaking to ring people about what you mean, right? Um, another hard part in accelerator science is that we tend to be a little sloppy with our definitions. So someone would be like, "Ah, oh, it's just the emittance," and you're like. Emittance. Do you mean normalized emittance? Geometric emittance? Is it the emittance of the whole beam or 90% of the beam? You know, so um, yeah, another soapbox. I'll step down. So, <laughs> sorry. And uh, a few more, right? There's a lot of other types of accelerators. Um, some are trying to address the problem of how massive they are. For example, plasma wake field accelerators. Uh, now, you'll see on that little plot up at the top here. Uh, these are just some of the plasma, there's different types. There's laser, laser plasma wake field, where they zap a laser through a tube of uh, plasma and then use the wake field from that to then power particles. Uh, they also have one where they have, for example, an electron or a proton kind of drive beam, like a witness go through, make the wake, and then the wake will accelerate the beam you really want. Um, and they are amazing, right? Within no space, you can get 100 MeV per meter, right? It's it's shocking. Right now, the problem is that beam that comes out isn't usable, right? It it, it shoots it out and it kind of sprays everywhere. Um, and so they're working on actually then containing that. Uh, so that that is 
work in progress and a hope for the future, right? Another one, dielectric, for example, accelerator on a chip, right? And so I do put links, you can see over there, this is an example of an accelerator on a chip, basically using a dielectric to, well, make a mini accelerator. Um, I won't go into all the details. There's also energy recovery Linux. And so some of you may recognize this machine from JLab's past. We used to have the world's most powerful tunable laser here at the lab, the free electron laser. Um, the building still exists. And a lot of this stuff is still installed and used as shelving for other equipment, um, but it still exists. Uh, it just doesn't operate anymore. Um, but it was also a, uh, demonstration of what's called an energy recovery link, which is similar to what I did with the, or what I showed with Click, where you actually accelerate a beam the first time around, for example, and the next time you put it on a different, you remember that synchronous phase plot I showed you, right? You stick it on a different part of that and you decelerate it. And then that energy is transferred to the next beam, which is then accelerated, right? And so this was a one up, one down, they say, one accelerating, one decelerating pass demonstration of an energy recovering LINAC. Um, this is important later. I'll leave that at that. Uh, and I have to mention an FFA, a fixed field alternating gradient accelerator. Uh, now these use fixed magnetic fields. You can either do an electromagnet with a constant field, or you can actually use permanent magnets for this. And essentially, like I was saying, you know, you bend one way and you have to bend the other. So that was for quads. You also have to do that for for the dipoles here, right? And so these are alternating gradient, plus, minus, plus, minus, fixed fields, and you're actually able to get multiple passes going through the same arc. Uh, and permanent magnets also means you're not drawing power, right? It doesn't take anything to power these magnets like it does in all our current arcs. The Cornell VNL uh, ERL test accelerator was both an energy recovering LINAC and a FFA. And this is kind of what we want here for our upgrade is a similar idea. And I will get more into that when we talk about the upgrade. And that's the break point. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, they, they were the only linear collider that actually has been commissioned and ran. Uh, the other linear colliders that we've worked on, like Click and ILC, they've, they're not built, right? So Slack worked. They worked in an unusual way, right? Where they had two parallel Linux and then like a loop to then collide them like that. Worked fine, right? But that's the only ever functioning linear collider. Um, the rest have been paper studies and, and some hardware studies as well, but never fully commissioned linear colliders, so. Right. So um, it, is, it is difficult, um, but and I'll try to show you in the next part of it. When they design these magnets, they actually design them with permanent magnet in a series of wedges that are shaped around it. And some of them, like if you look at the magnetic fields of them, some will go in, some will go sideways, some will go up. And what they do is they create a good field region in an aperture that different beams can sample a different part of and be controlled. Now, as those beams go through this kind of like oblong aperture, they're both doing the focus defocusing, right, that I mentioned, but they're also wobbling, right, because you're bending in, you're bending out. And, uh, and, and, but if you design these permanent magnets in such a way, they're called Hallbach magnets, um, you can actually get a good field region where you can get multiple passes going through a slightly different part of the beam pipe and control them. There's limits on that. You can't do it forever, right, but you can get, depending on how you design the magnets, you can get multiple passes through at the same time. Um, and it's just how it's designed. So, uh, so, so, so because it's protons, right? Um, once you get relativistic, uh, so, so when you have a low V over C for a proton, it makes sense to have a Linac because you want something that can get it from going still to moving at a decent clip, right? And so you have, for example, a drift tube Linac first, and then you have, uh, you know, what they call a, like low beta, so low V over C cryomodules, right? And then they change in size as the V over C goes, right? And then they change in distance between them. But if you have to keep doing that as it increases, you know, you're just going to, it's going to be really inefficient and really, really long. And so once you get to a decent V over C, then you can stick it into 
a ring and yeah, send it around and give it a kick every time around. It's a lot more efficient that way. And and I joke about being biased towards Linux, but I mean, rings are important, right? I've just never worked on them, so I'm biased, but. <laughs> High energy for for like protons and, and ions and stuff like that. Yeah. If you want to do high energy electrons, because they give off synchrotron radiation, it's usually better to go with a Linux. So hopefully I won't get in trouble with this. So there's two main linear collider ideas right now. The ILC, International Linear Collider, which would be based in Japan. Uh, right now, it's kind of in a political hang up because it's expensive and Japan's like, do we want this? Even though they said they wanted it. And now they're like, do we want it? Can everyone else help pitch in? And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're like, no, really, can you help pay? And we're all like, yeah, yeah. But it's just kind of like waiting. Uh, now click would be built at CERN. And this is where things kind of fell apart there. So, so ILC was the first big one. It's about 30, 35 years of progress, right? That is almost shovel ready, right? Like if they give a go ahead in Japan, we are pretty much ready to build ILC. All the technology has been tested. Like I said, the XFEL in DESI is like a small scale ILC LINAC, right? There's a couple little components, mainly in the dump area where they're still trying to work out some minor details, but by the time they build it, they'll have that figured out as well, right? Uh, Click is a little bit younger based on different technology. Um, it would go to a higher energy than ILC, but it's also bigger, which is also funny, right? Cause it's bigger than the ILC, but it's the compact linear collider. But um, it's it's basically, it's super expensive. I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head. And CERN has to decide if they want to do this giant 100 kilometer ring or this 50 kilometer LINAC, right? And the science case, so, so the, the linear colliders, we could phase them. And so you can, for example, start with a shorter uh, LINAC on both sides and do a lower energy, right? And then for example, uh, 380, GEV center of mass collision energy is kind of where you could do a Higgs factory and just produce a ton of Higgs. And because you're using electrons and positrons, it's kind of clean collisions, right? You don't have as much of the other stuff breaking off and you can really study what's happening with the Higgs. Um, and then you can scale it up for discovery, right? Uh, same with ILC, but they're still limited in energy, right? We're talking three TEV center of mass energy was the, the full version of Click. And FCC is looking at much higher energies and they're like, oh, we can probe the energy frontier and find new particles and see what's going on. And so CERN kind of was like, yeah, I know we've been working on Click for 25 years, but this is shiny and, and maybe we'll do this. And so Click isn't officially you know, dead. And the spinoff technology has been used widely, like uh, something called X-band technology, which I'll let you Google, but like, most of that came from Click, right? Like a lot of good spin-off technology came from Click over the last 25 years. Uh, but yeah, they kind of had to put their foot in one camp or the other, and they put it in what seems to be the ring camp a little more. Yeah, yeah, the shiny new thing. Um, and, and the science case, arguably, right? Maybe there's more at higher energies than we can do. It's a cost to benefit thing, right? Like we spend billions of Swiss francs or or billions of Swiss francs, what are we getting for that? And and yeah, so anyway. Oh, geez. Um, okay, so uh, I'm trying to think of the easiest way to answer that. Let me think of another way to answer that. I'll think of a better way, a uh, quick way to answer why they don't give off the synchrotron radiation. I don't have a good answer off the top of my head right now. Um, sorry, let's give me your email or something and I'll try to come up with a good way to explain that, okay? All right. Uh, <laughs> um, this is also, uh, so the electron ion collider ring, yes. So again, linear colliders are really difficult to actually get things to hit each other, right? Um, and so I think part of the reason was like ring colliders are kind of known, right? We basically, you can blow up everything and then like blow up the beam size and then shrink it back down at an IP and you get another shot around, right? Uh, and so, yeah, if you miss, the particle goes back around again, it gets another chance, right? The luminosity ends up being bigger in a ring. And that's usually what, and please correct me if I'm wrong, experimentalists in the room, but usually experimentalists really care about luminosity, right? They just want to know, yeah, they, they just care about luminosity, right? Uh, so, <laughs> um, so, so that's really the big answer is, is that. Now, 
I don't know if you saw some of the early designs at JLab. So it's JLab and Brookhaven were both collab competing for the site, right? And JLab's design actually was like a figure eight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and but they did that in a clever way to where they could minimize synchrotron radiation loss while doing it. Um, but nonetheless, right? It was a pretty cool, elegant design, but it, it you know, it did not get chosen. So, but it, I think the biggest reason is luminosity. So. Okay. Thank you.